Uh, good morning, everybody. We will uh, discuss with each other today the fetal birth injury. Fetal birth injury could be avoidable and could be unavoidable mechanical, hypoxic, and ischemic injury of the fetus uh, of the infant in unit after delivery. And if you have a baby with a problem or injury related to birth, then you will blame the doctor all the time because this is an uh, this is avoidable problem. So the doctor is the one who is guilty regarding this, or it could occur. Be and this doctor did his best to avoid it, but because it is unavoidable problem, complication occur. It is avoidable and unavoidable. But what is the part which can be avoided and what is the part which is not avoided or can't be avoided? This is what will uh, be being shown in our. Uh, it could result from a medical situation, whether it is deficient or inappropriate medication, but it, uh, medical uh, interference, but it could occur also. There is good skill and good competent of the obstetric care. So there is a risk for its occurrence. Uh, it represents two to seven per thousand of live births, and maybe the, pre the predisposing kids, maybe a baby, large baby like that, this is a baby macrosomy, but the small baby is also liable for prematurity. Maybe cephalopelvic disproportion if you have this large baby and the narrow pelvis, or if you have a small baby and uh, large uh, narrow pelvis also, so it could happen. Dystocia and prolonged labor also mild presentation. What is the type of injury? This injury commonly affects the fetal head. Why it affects the fetal head? Because the head is the common presentation. The cephalic presentation represents ninety six percent of presentation. So the most common part to be affected by injury is head, which is the presenting part. But some problem may be risky, like intracranial hemorrhage, but some defects may be, or uh, injuries may be not risky, like subconjunctival hemorrhage or caput succedinium and kefal hematoma. What is this caput succedinium? It's a collection of edema or fluid under the skull, under the soft bone. And this could be of benign course, and it could be related to instrumental delivery or it could occur spontaneously in normal labor without any interruption, like this. This is the collection, if the collection of fluid under the scalp, this is caput succedinium, but if it collect under the periosteum, this is kefal hematoma, and if it under the dura, this is an extradural hemorrhage, and if it is in the brain matter itself, this is intracranial hemorrhage, like the arms. Kefal hematoma is another form of swelling appear at the baby head, but it is a collection of blood, so it is a subperiosteal hemorrhage. It is more risky than caput succedinium and comparison between them. In kefal hematoma, because it's a collection of blood, so it can occur a few hours or days after birth, it appear later on, but this one will appear at birth. This one is limited by suture, not limited by suture and dislocalized the other one because it is edema, it is diffuse, it is ill-defined age, it's soft and it disappear in few days. This one may persist to four weeks and it is not beating and it is well defined. The next problem in the head is intracranial hemorrhage. And the intracranial hemorrhage occur if you use the forceps for delivery and this forceps is not used precisely or not correctly used. So if you use it good, it will not result in intracranial hemorrhage. Fracture skull may occur if the baby is draw, uh, dropped on the head, while well, this can occur in precipitated labor. And sudden compression and decompression of the fetal head in breach and the precipitated labor. Why? Why is this could occur? Normally in pregnancy, there is contraction of the uterus and then the relaxation. This contraction and the relaxation takes its time. So the baby head will not compressed and decompressed rapidly. But in case of breach and the precipitated labor, the compression and the decompression occur very soon. 
So there is increase in the intracranial tension. This increase in the, in, in the intracranial tension will lead to rupture of some blood vessels, leading to the intracranial hemorrhage. There is predisposing factors. Not every baby, every baby is exposed to compression and decompression, but the premature baby is more vulnerable to this. The baby with blood disease is also more vulnerable. Also, the baby having ischemia or asphyxia in the vascular wound will be more vulnerable to intracranial hemorrhage. So there is predisposing causes and there is actual cause. How is this manifest? It is manifest after delivery by difficulty in breathing, by vomiting, bulging of the anterior fontanelle, and absence of uh, altered conscious and the prophylaxis. Once there is prophylaxis, so you can avoid it. Prophylaxis by vitamin K, by give, uh, making episiotomy, and by good forceps delivery. The next injury is the peripheral nerve injury. And this peripheral nerve injury occurs in the brachial plexus because also the head is a common presentation. So the next part is the shoulder. It occurs due to overtraction of the fetal neck, either in shoulder dystocia or after coming head and breach. This is the two situations. And we have two types of brachial plexus palsy. Herbs palsy and the clumpy. Herbs and overstretching of the brachial plexus, the lower part, the upper part of the brachial plexus. But if it is in the lower uh, segments, this is the clumpy. And when it could occur, it could occur if you have a macrosomic baby or extended arm in breach presentation, or you did traction on the uh, fetus uh, head and on the fetal shoulder while you are delivering a baby in shoulder distortion. This is a baby become handicapped after this, but you have to avoid this. You will do your best, but this can occur although you did everything to avoid because shoulder dystocia may be faced in an emergency situation without planning or without reduction and uh, uh, participation. Okay, so in this situation, it is unavoidable. But if you predict the case, you have to avoid it. This is the other form of brachial plexus. What is the prognosis? Depend on what happened to the nerve. If paralysis occurred due to edema and the hemorrhage about the nerve function, function should, should return within a few months. But if there is laceration, there is permanent damage of the nerve. The clavicle is a common site for fracture, and this fracture of the clavicle may be intended to be done or maybe a okay, response to this. You can intend to rupture the, the, to fracture the clavicle while you are managing a case of shoulder dystocia to decrease the basic cromial diameter. But it can occur without planning, but it is forgivable. Both. It will heal, just you will immobilize the baby. So if fracture clavicle occur, there is no blame because it will heal and there is no further a handicapping for the baby. There is other rare fractures like that. It is a, a catastrophe to have a baby delivered vaginally by a trained obstetrician and then you have a fracture of the long bones or maybe you have an abdominal injury. This, this delivery is very difficult delivery. What happened to do this with the baby? So this could be avoided if it is managed by a trained obstetrician. But as forms of Injuries like, as I said, fractured clavicle, like intracranial hemorrhage, maybe not avoided. So you have to know which part could be avoided, which part can't be avoided, because maybe you will be uh, a senior uh, doctor and maybe you are the one who is doing investigation of a birth injury. So you must know this knowledge. Thank you for letting me and hope it. Uh, is beneficial for you and can you you can contact me on my whatsapp uh, 010-11-323297 i am waiting for your questions for your uh, suggestions and hope it is good for you thank you